Welcome back to period two of A Push Exam Cram, pre-revolution. Last time we talked about the rise of the English. The first English attempt at colonization was in the new land at Jamestown, Virginia in 1607. But it soon failed because the Virginia Company, the joint stock company that funded the trip, didn't provide enough resources. John Smith was the leader in charge, and eventually he helped to turn Jamestown around. However, the starving time refers to a time at first when there was no food because the settlers were busy looking for gold and not farming. Many settlers died while others had to resort to cannibalism. One of the first encounters the English had was with natives, and one group was the Powhatans with their chief Powhatan and the famous daughter of the chief, Pocahontas. Both groups fought extensively during their time with each other, and but John Rolfe was an Englishman who eventually saved Jamestown by cultivating Spanish tobacco, which was rich in quality and pricing. He also helped to establish a bridge between these two cultures. He soon married Pocahontas and took her to England, but rip, she died there. So Virginia was basically the first colony started. They had a government called the House of Burgesses, which was like the first democracy in the Western world, where only white male landowners could vote, and they also had a headright system for distributing free land to new settlers. As more land was dished out, however, and people grew more tobacco, there was a heavy dependence on indentured servitude, where landowners like the Tidewater aristocracy would pay for generally young people to come over from places like England to work for seven years and then give them their own free land. But Bacon's Rebellion happened when indentured servants, who usually own lands more westward, revolted against their masters who were not helping the servants fend off natives. And this brought a shift to slavery through the Middle Passage, which was the passage of slaves from Africa to America, and the establishment of slave codes, which was a much more reliable labor force. Another colony that grew nearby Virginia was Maryland, and it was heavily based on religious toleration. It was established by Lord Baltimore and was a Catholic and Christian safe haven. Religion also played a large role in the establishment of colonies in the Northeast. Protestant religions such as Puritanism that came from the teachings of John Calvin faced persecution in England, so they decided to come to America. William Bradford was the Puritan governor who established a colony in Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1620. And these were the first pilgrims, you know, with the Mayflower and signing the Mayflower Compact, which was rules for living in this new land. John Winthrop was also a Puritan, but he immigrated and started the Massachusetts Bay Colony, which was near Plymouth in 1630. He established the idea of a shining city on a hill that this new colony was. It's important to know that these people are different. William Penn was a Quaker, which was another Protestant group at this time that helped to establish Pennsylvania. And this state granted freedom of worship as well, and was also anti-slavery, which was kind of rare at this time. There, these were the different types of proprietary colonies at this time, where different independent rulers were able to rule their colonies. However, dissent soon came. Roger Williams was kicked out of the Massachusetts Bay Colony after challenging Puritanism and helping natives, so he went on to form Rhode Island and the Baptist Church. Anne Hutchinson was also similar in that she spoke out and preached even though she was a woman, which was not allowed at the time. She got banished to Rhode Island as well. Religious revivals were common during this time as well in the First Great Awakening. Important figures like Jonathan Edwards, who was a Congregationalist and wrote Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, and George Whitfield, who was a British preacher, really helped Protestantism take off during this time. After this, there was still a lot of conflict with natives, however. Wars such as King Philip's War resulted in natives losing much of their lands to whites, and the French and Indian War, where British allies fought against French allies. In the French and Indian War, colonies met in the Albany Congress to try and establish an alliance to help fend off against the French and their natives. This was called the Albany Plan of Union, and it was dreamed up by Benjamin Franklin. This was also the join or die political cartoon. Eventually, the French and Indian War also ended with a proclamation of 1763, where the British banned the colonists from going west of the Appalachian Mountains, because if they went west, the British fear was that colonists might interfere with natives and might start another war over again. During this time, navigation acts were in place to try to regulate trade and mercantilism for Britain and her colonies. But during this time, the navigation acts were not very strictly enforced in the Atlantic, and this policy was known as salutary neglect. Mercantilism was the predominant market ways of this time, and it was done through a bunch of joint stock companies, which were like the predecessors to the modern corporation, such as the Virginia Company. 
This mercantilism eventually led to a big triangular trade that involved Europe, Africa, and the Americas, trading all sorts of stuff from slaves to different types of cash crops. Important people also helped to develop America before the revolution. One was John Peter Zenger, who was a newspaper printer in the 18th century. He argued for the power of the press, so he didn't like what the royal governor was doing in New York from 1734 to 1735, and as a result, he wrote about it. And thus, he was put on trial for apparently an act of treason. Well, the jury went against the royal governor and decided that Zenger was innocent, and what he had written was actually true. This set the standards for democracy and eventually allowed for freedom of the press, which is a core ideal of America, of course. Another person was Phyllis Wheatley. She was born a slave girl, but eventually she became a pretty successful poet. And even though she didn't have formal education, she eventually went to England and her poems were widely acclaimed. This showed that slaves sometimes could get power that they needed or wanted. Finally, there was the Iroquois Confederacy. This was really the last main Native Americans confederation against the white people. This consisted of many groups, mostly in the New York areas and northeast of the United States. It was a military power that consisted of groups such as the Mohawks, Onedas, Cayugas, and Senecas, and they were basically the most powerful political organization of natives for decades later into colonial America. Eventually, however, this group was defeated because the Europeans just had much better technology and were able to beat down the natives. So this has been chapter two of a push exam cram thanks so much for watching make sure to subscribe if you haven't already and share these videos with your friends and see you in period three